if you grow up around gangsters, pimps, drug dealers, and hustlers, it's a high probability that's what you are going to do. If we grew up around stockbrokers, we would both right now be working on Wall Street. I started selling drugs at the age of 13 because I was just trying to eat and just stay fly. This is my spot right here, 198 of Murdoch. I spent countless hours here, 12, 24, 48. This is where the drug trade was, all day, every day. There was nothing else to do but to sell drugs. It was cool, almost like a cool thing to do. And I didn't have options before. I couldn't go into a Google search and put in veterinarian and all this stuff come up and that's what I want to do. No, we didn't have that back then. With the weed, we was making hundreds, hundreds of dollars a day and crack, it just exploded and we started making hand over fist thousands of dollars in a week. Like, you know, I had a shoebox full of money, rubber bands tied up in my girlfriend's house. So we went from pro keds to wearing Adidas, buying a lot of jewelry. Everything was moving up, but the community was coming down because people were dying. People were getting shot, people was getting robbed, people was getting raped. It, it just decimated the, the community. The Supreme Team was one of the most notorious drug conglomerates in the, on the East Coast, definitely in New York City at the time in the 80s. There was a lot of murder involved in that, but they was very heavy-handed. And he ran a very strategic drug operation. We was making thousands and thousands of dollars a day. And you're talking about on South Queens at the time, it was a dilapidated place. There was thousands of dollars coming in at the height of the crack era. You know, they say they was making $200,000 a week. Over here in Baisley Park, so we had this whole, the whole park was, you know, the Supreme Team. So, like, I had this area here. I would have this area here. You got to understand Supreme Team, all the lieutenants had different color caps on that crack cocaine. So like, I might have the blue caps, you know, so I was here, if you wanted blue, you knew you came over here. Then on the handball court, there was another worker, then we had a worker in the basketball court. We had somebody down here over by the baseball field. So it was, it was just crack all over the park. Well, they was able to avoid police scrutiny a, a, a couple of reasons. One, they was paying off the police. The police were getting paid off. If you in it, it's a high probability you're gonna get locked up. It's a high probability you're gonna die. That's just what it is. It's dead or in jail for you young people out there. That's what the drug game is, death or jail. You don't want those options. The reason I wanted to get out of selling drugs was December 12th, 1986. That's a big day for me. When I held my son in my arm in Brookdale Hospital, so I said, I can't leave my kids in the street. And that day was the day I really said, look, I gotta, I gotta change my life. When that army recruiter came to pick me up and I just looked in that rear view mirror and was driving saying, I'm leaving all of this. It's all behind me now. I'm never going back. I got an opportunity to change my life. I'm going to make the best of it. When I became a police officer and I figured out the trajectory of my life from selling drugs to coming into policing, I knew it wasn't normal. And I was able to read people. I brought that to the police department. We're in front of the 67th precinct where I was the first black commanding officer in the history of the NYPD to command this lovely precinct over here in the East Flatbush community. People just didn't like me because I was young and black. I'm hip hop, you know, I got this swag. I mean, but I was as smart, if not smarter, than most people that I worked for. <laughs> I definitely had more knowledge about police work because I was in the streets. I knew how to deal with crime because I was a former criminal. So September 2014, the New York Post that rag of a newspaper put me on the front cover and called me a thug cop. And I know that was, that was fed by the PBA, the Police Benevolent Association. And my life includes me selling drugs, carrying guns, trying to kill people, all of that. But then, you know, I morphed into this great police commander in the NYPD. But they forgot about all that part. They wanted to just peg me into this thug. And I never was a thug cop. And they tried to say I lied to get on the police force and all this. Well until they changed the application, because nobody asked me on the application, did I ever sell crack cocaine? If they would have asked me, I would have said, yeah, I sell crack every day. I definitely want to have a nonprofit to try to help some of these kids. Well, my ultimate goal is to just get on the speaking circuit. I want to just go out and talk to these kids and try to help. Like, I'm not somebody that don't come back and forget where they came from. I'm here, I'm in and I'm out. But I never forget where I came from. They rename this park after me. If we sell a lot of books, <laughs> at least name the basketball courts or something after me. <laughs>
I need T.I. to play me in this next Flix movie that we're gonna get once a cop. T.I., come on, man. <laughs> Hook me up. You can play me young and old, bro. <laughs>